Adam and Eve fell into sin as the federal heads of the human race, and everyone since then has sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one. And so the gospel depends on a real Adam because Adam and Eve plunged us into sin, plunged this earth and this world into corruption. How do you explain evil? You have to go back to the beginning to see what's going on there. But the Lord uh, Jesus Christ came to redeem us by dying for our sins on the cross. And through his blood, we, we receive redemption from sin, which all started because of Adam. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Creation.Live. In each episode of this show, ICR scientists gather with subject matter experts, apologists, and other special guests to discuss pressing issues, whether that be ICR's current research, something new that's come to light in the scientific community, or something else entirely that ultimately impacts how science points to our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope that these conversations are encouraging and enlightening in an increasingly chaotic world. I have with me today my co-host Michael. Greetings. Uh, Dr. Thomas, paleobiochemist. Hi. And Dr. Tompkins, our geneticist. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you, Trey. Yeah. So today we're actually going to be discussing a topic that's kind of come back into the limelight. Uh, the concept of a mythical versus literal atom. Um, so we know here at the Institute for Creation Research that evolution typically those who follow the evolutionary theory typically deny a literal atom. No, you don't mean like atoms. No, no, you, sorry. You mean the guy named the guy in the Adam, garden. Okay. Just A-D-A-M, okay, man. Right. Uh, yes. A real person named Adam. Uh, so you say. So I say. Oh, yes. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> well, we will find out. Um, and of course, this contrasts with the Genesis account and many other spots in scripture where they refer to this Adam um, and we know that also that in the community of, of even Christians today, that this is, this has become a question of was Adam a real person? So, uh, we're going to be talking about that today. Do y'all have any, uh, any background or history before we dig into some of these questions? I went to the Evangelical Theological Society meeting just last fall in Denver and now these are the these are the top guys who write the textbooks that are used in seminaries to teach our pastors, mm. and so I wanted to go to get my finger on the pulse of what are they saying about Adam? They're saying lots of good things about many aspects of Scripture and about God, but when it comes to Adam, um, they had they had a particular uh, session you could attend, and there were four positions on Adam represented in this session. Mm. None of the four represented the, the possibility that Adam was real. None of them. None of them. Wow. It's, and so this is, this is the state that we're in within, you know, we're calling ourselves evangelicals, which is supposed to mean, I thought, that we believe the Bible, mm -hmm. and Adam is in the Bible. And so what we had in that session was four different um, Christian philosophers and theologians who were trying to defend four different ways to um, to redefine what Adam might mean because mm. all of them are convinced that science has proved that there was no Adam. And so they have to modify scripture, right? Because science has proved that there's no there's no there was no real person named Adam. Follow so that's the, the science. That's the state we're in. Yeah. And you know, so no wonder our pastors are feeling anxious about preaching, you know, the early chapters of Genesis because they're like, well, how do I deal with the science that's, that refutes Adam? So we want to talk about some of that today. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Anything to add here at the start? Yeah, ultimately the science that supposedly disproves Adam is the idea of human evolution, that we evolved from an ape-like ancestor. Okay. And so it's purely theoretical and there really is no rock solid evidence for that in paleontology or genetics. And we can talk about that a little bit later. For sure. Well, then let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, for those who, uh, we'll say for Christians, uh, for non-believers, it's not really an issue of, of whether or not they believe in Adam. There's no stakes there. I guess from their mind, 
mindset. But for believers in particular, for Christians who don't believe in a literal Adam, uh, what do they believe about this issue? Well, there's two, you know, basic camps, and there's there's sub camps within these camps. The first is that humans evolved from an ape-like ancestor, and there never was a real Adam at any point. Then you have another camp where they believe that humans evolved from an ape-like ancestor, but then God chose this hominid that was evolved enough to be an Adam or an archetype of Adam. So William Lane Craig actually believes that, that particular theory or idea. Hmm. Are there any other sub sub beliefs even more specific than that? Or well, there's there's the sub belief or the the true belief that there was a real Adam mm-hmm. about six thousand years ago, and the scriptures affirm it, and so does good science. I was really curious when you mentioned the the theological um, event that you went to that four positions, none of them were a literal human, Adam. How'd that consensus come about, and why do people believe that consensus? Well, first of all, I, I, when I see that there are four different views, um, I here's what I see. The, the word says refers to Adam in a whole lot of places as a real person. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15. One of many examples, in addition to Genesis itself. And so when we, when we read that, when we read the word Adam in the Bible, what, are, what is it supposed to mean? Now, because the context allows only one interpretation— it's the guy who was in the garden with Eve, his wife. That's it. Uh, if you're going to say it's something not that, it's not that guy, then it turns out that the, that the only um, resource that you have to redefine that name, that word, is your own imagination. Mm-hmm. It's so it, it, it has to come from humans, from s- storytelling. And so that's why... One guy says this, another guy says that, and frankly, I don't care what they're saying <laughs> because <laughs> I know the source of it is not from the Bible. And so I, I don't, I'm not interested in parsing out what this guy believes and what that guy believes because all of them are going to differ because they're all coming from individual, unreliable um, sources like our imaginations. Now, we're supposed to use our imagination. I'm not saying that's, that's bad, but what, I'm, what I am saying is if the Bible says it and the Bible is God's word, we need to have a really, really strong reason to doubt the plain, straightforward meaning. And as scientists, I would say Dr. Tompkins and I, um, uh, we're, we're kind of able to translate science. You know, we're kind of we're able to read the science papers, and we're able to see the assumptions that go into. The, the, that process. So we see that they're collecting these data, whether it be fossils, um, you know, the shape of a skull or whatever, or those data, maybe it's genetic sequence data, and that's the raw data. Now, none of the raw data that we've seen uh, requires an interpretation that, uh, that, that uh, nullifies Adam. And in fact, a lot of the data that we've seen um, supports a, a, a literal Adam, and so shame on these shame on these Christians who are only paying attention to the to the secular mainstream, frankly God denying, uh, Bible denying scientific results, uh, and they're just why why are we paying attention to those results? Because they've been interpreted, and the data have been force fit into a Darwinian long age, uh, uh, eons of slow and gradual change um, mindset or, or worldview. And that, that, that's just storytelling, like Dr. Jeff said in the opening, that's storytelling that's taking the place of science. Mm. Um, so, so I, you know, when you ask me about um, what are people thinking today, 
it, it's like, well, we're not, we're not letting the Word of God inform us. And that's the role of the Word of God. It's, to, it's God telling us stuff and we, that we need to hear. Um, and so I, I, guess, I guess I've already laid my, all my cards on the table. <laughs> it's like we need to hear what God has to say. We don't need to be the ones telling him what he really meant. It reminds me of the, of the, of the serpent in the garden, which they say didn't exist. But there's the serpent in the garden telling Eve, did God really say? And it's like, did God really say, Adam? He didn't mean that. Um, and there's consequences mm -hmm. to this to this erasing of Adam, and the consequences are serious. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we get to that. Certainly. With Adam, if we're going to question Adam, then shouldn't we then also question, was Noah real? Was Abraham real? And like now it's like, wait a minute, what about the whole history of Israel, the, con the country we have today, their whole history? Is it just a lie? Is it a myth of their background and their history? So where do we stop? Where do we draw the line on who's real or who's not? And does following the science, what science, what does that mean? I mean, human evolution, y'all can speak to this. Is it really decided that, yes, this is fact? That was a loaded question because we're ICRs, so we have an answer. <laughs> but yeah, how would you address that? Well, both myself and Dr. Thomas have, have talks that we give to, to the public um, showing that basically in the fossil record, you have humans, you have apes, and there's really nothing in between. And I have quotes from evolutionists that actually admit that, that, that we have no transitional forms. It's a huge problem. And so the missing link is still missing as far as the fossil and record will goes. always will be. Yeah. <laughs> And actually a good bit of DNA sequence data has come in in recent years. Um, probably the two top papers I'm thinking of were both done by conventional evolutionary type scientists. And one was published in 2012, the other in 2013. And as what they did was they sequenced just the protein coding regions of the human genome in five to 6,000 people each paper uh, from North America and from Europe, and they looked so at that's, these. Sorry, that, that's like less than four percent of the entire. Oh, that's three yeah. It's a, well, it's about two percent. Yeah. Wow. Of the human genome, they're called they're called exomes, which stands for the sequencing of exons in genes. So, so exons in genes are the protein coding regions of of a gene. Actually, the gene is much longer than than just the amount of exons. But the exons code for proteins. They're very intolerant of mutation. Because if you get a mutation in an exon, it really messes stuff up. In fact, these papers said that over 80% of these mutations in exons um, were related to heart, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, just detrimental human Ill, illnesses. So, mm -hmm. But they called these rare variants. And so they actually, instead of calibrating their, their molecular clocks or their models, with deep evolutionary time, millions of years, they actually looked at how fast human populations grow and reproduce based on real uh, pragmatic data. And that's the model they used. And based on that, they discovered that these exon regions only dated back to about 5,000 to 6,000 years ago. Interesting. And so that would essentially be the the creation date about mm -hmm. 6,000 years ago. Biblical mm -hmm. timeline right there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They claim that before that, uh, the human genome flatlined. <laughs> and so, so they actually have a graph where, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, it's flat. And then all of a sudden, all this variation starts appearing about 6,000 <laughs> years ago. That sounds very scientific. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, so today we have we have all these scientific studies that we can that we can do that can actually dig into some of this. Um, I'm thinking maybe earlier in history. Uh, I feel like this is a, a more common problem. I mean, has the church always struggled with this dichotomy of literal versus you know this mytho Adam kind of thing? But how has the church historically? Where what's their stance been on this historically? Uh, I'm, I'm no historian and don't have expertise in this area, but from what I've heard from them, uh, what little bit I've heard, and I, you know, hopefully our viewers can correct us if I'm wrong. But Oh, they will. Our, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chime in. We welcome comments. Yes, please yeah. comment. So my understanding is that um, it wasn't really until the Enlightenment 
which mm. we sometimes call the endarkenment, uh, Fair. Um, came into play where we have the introduction, the 1700s of deep time, and then we have, um, and then we have riding on that vehicle of deep time, we have slow and gradual creature changes, a la Darwinism, mm -hmm. so that now we have this pre prevailing story about how fish turned into people, and that's how we got here. Um, it wasn't so. So that's obviously a different historical drama that, or account. It's not really an account because there's no one. No one saw that. Right. Um, but it's, it's it's a different historical model than the Bible presents. So what were people believing? before the Enlightenment and before evolutionary ideas took hold of Western thinking. They got their history from the Bible. And there was no, no one walked around and said, there was no Adam, or very few people. The, every generation has its own set of skeptics. But they exerted their skeptical leverage, their fists against God and his word, in different ways. They didn't, they didn't really have any, from what I understand, well, any, there was any, another movement going on that that overlapped with that, and that was this higher criticism movement, yep. which was kind of centered in Germany, but mm -hmm. actually spread all over Europe and the world. And that was that the Bible is nothing more than any other piece of literature. It's mm -hmm. not divinely inspired. <laughs> the Old Testament has errors in it. And so that fit perfectly with all of this pseudoscience that was creeping into the picture as well. So the two... The two movements kind of fit together to create a perfect storm for uh, proclaiming that Genesis was not historically accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Certain, so, so, yeah. so now we have now we have this this cocktail of beliefs that says you can't trust the Bible, you can't trust Genesis. Adam was a myth. Science has proved that there was no Adam, and we're sitting here, both Dr. Tompkins and I. We used to believe all of that. But we used to believe all because it's all we had ever been taught, and then, and then there were certain circumstances in our lives where it challenged us to rethink what we were taught, and to examine what these crazy creationists were saying about Adam <laughs> and Genesis and science. And we both discovered science that supports uh, Genesis and Adam being literal, both you know actual history. And for both of us, you know, it was such a mind blowing and life changing. Um, experience that we've both dedicated our lives to uh, wanting other Christians to see the science that does support um, uh, the history mm -hmm. that's in the Bible. And, and I would say we want people to, to discern what they're reading mm -hmm. and not to just take at faith. And when I, when I say people, I mean the top guys in seminaries or the top guys who are teaching the top guys in seminaries. Yes. We, we urge you to to uh, to use your you know powers of discernment to like to tease apart what aspects of this scientific sounding conclusion come from the data what aspects do the data support and uh, do these can these data be interpreted according to the Bible and what we found is in every case not only can the same data be interpreted according to the Bible but it could be interpreted with fewer assumptions by using the biblical model and that's kind of what we do that's part of what we do here at the Institute. I think we have completely strayed from the original question. <laughs> you asked something about the history. <laughs> no, and my that's... bottom line answer is um, I, this challenge to the historical Adam, in my view, ha has only arisen you know, in the last two, 300 years, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I have a follow-up question, though. Since you both are scientists, and you've kind of alluded to this a minute ago, what was the one, your top evidence that brought you, even as a Christian, from evolution to becoming a creationist? Well, I would say for me it was uh, reading Scientific Creationism by Henry Morris II. And the glaring fact that there are no undisputed transitional forms in the fossil record, that creatures appear suddenly in the rock record, which we know was formed by the global flood, bearing creatures progressively and, and rapidly um, over the, the roughly year-long period of the flood. And so that was it for me. You know, there's no evidence for evolution in the fossil record. We don't see creatures morphing into other types of creatures now. You know, dogs always make more dogs and rabbits more rabbits and so on. So it was just the lack of evidence for evolution in general. 
And what else do you have? You have a, a creator, created everything after their kind, created humans in the image of God. And so it's exactly what we see in the real world is what we see in the Bible. Yeah, especially Genesis chapter 1, which repeats 10 times as though God's trying to make a point. Uh, you know, be fruitful, multiply, and, and, and uh, multiply according to kind, after his kind. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what we see today for sure. Um, yeah, there's variation within each kind, but, um, they, but each kind also stays true to its basic form. And we see that. And then for me, it was the same idea. I read the same book, Scientific Creationism, mm -hmm. and it blew my mind. And I thought, wow, I did not know that. You know, I, I just didn't know this stuff. And I, my professors never taught me this. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I can illustrate it with a, a specific example. It was with this bird fossil named Archaeopteryx. And my professor of zoology taught the whole class, this is proof of evolution because it's part bird, but it has, it's bird mostly, but it has remnants of its reptilian ancestry because reptiles evolved into birds. Hmm. And so I thought, that's it. It's proof of evolution. That's all I need. Um, and, and then I read in this book uh, quotes from other evolutionists who disagreed with my professor he never talked about those who disagreed with him, uh, who actually were paleontologists and who themselves had studied the fossil firsthand, unlike my professor. Um, and they, what did they say about it? They said, well, this is an extinct bird. Mm. Like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Here's this pillar upon which we're resting this entire paradigm of evolution. And it's like, it, some guys say it's evidence for evolution. Some guys say it's, um, it's, it's, equivocal, like there's no, like Dr. Jeff said, um, there's no undisputed. This, so this was a transitional form in my, in my professor's mind, and he taught generations of students to think that way, but he wasn't telling us that it was disputed by his own colleagues. And they're saying, this is just an evolutionary dead end. These aren't remnants of its reptilian ancestry. Um, it's just an extinct bird variety. And that fits really well, <laughs> mm -hmm. I realized, with the creation according to kinds model. And then once I fit fossils, as I mean, how do you get fossils anyways? Like, that doesn't happen. And so once I realized, you know, birds getting knocked out of the sky down into mud that don't rot, don't get scavenged, mm -hmm. but get buried so deep so fast that they turn into fossils, that happened everywhere, mm -hmm. but it happens nowhere today, but everywhere in the past. That also fits the flood, the, the, you know, the, the Genesis... Um, flood model. And so when I saw that, that's when I realized, oh man, I've been getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. But the Bible's been getting it right. And so then I went back to Genesis and read about Adam again. And I was like, okay, I'm starting to believe this. And then when I went back to, let's say, 1 Corinthians 15, as in Adam all die, now I have more confidence as a Christian that Adam was a real person and that I descended from him and that I'm, a, I'm going to die because I'm in Adam. And I need to be in Christ to escape this penalty of death, this penalty that Christ took on in my place. Mm. So we see, did I originally believe in a literal Adam when I trusted Christ at first? No, I did not. Mm. But could I defend logically, theologically, biblically, could I defend that same gospel of Christ being my substitute? Uh, I could not. I couldn't you can't defend the gospel um, without a, an actual Adam in, in those different ways. So that's, um, that's why I went into the sciences, so I could, so I could figure out more of, of yeah. this kind of evidence that supports what, what, I've, what I was learning to be true, the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to Adam then, uh, surely uh, both theologically, historically, scientifically, that's more than both, that's three things, um, is there evidence that points towards a literal atom? Uh, what are your thoughts? I talked about those two studies that were done in 2012 and 2013, but there was a study done with mitochondrial DNA in the late 1990s. And I'd actually like to read a, a quote from that study, but is what they did is they looked at the mitochondrial genomes from thousands of people around the world. So outside the nucleus in your cell is a little energy factory called a mitochondria. 
And it's a little organelle that actually has its own little piece of circular DNA. It's about 15,000 DNA letters long. And you inherit that from your mother and not from your father because it's in the, the female egg. Mm. And so anyways, they actually looked at the variation um, in the mitochondrial DNA and used the same empirical approach that I talked about in the other studies. And so I'd like to actually read a quote. So this is a quote from that paper. It was actually in the journal Nature Genetics in 1997. And they said this, using our empirical rate to calibrate the mitochondrial DNA molecular clock would result in an age of the mitochondrial DNA MRCA, which is most recent common ancestor, or in, a, <laughs> or in simple terms, the first human woman, and they say of only about 6,500 years. Wow. That's a quote from this paper. Wow. It was done by secular conventional uh, scientists. And so there are multiple places in the literature where they use empirical methods based on the, the DNA variation and they come up with biblical age ranges for the first humans. How do they reconcile that then with, is it how many hundreds of thousands of years? Is that correct? That yeah, humans they have, have been around? well, they have a model called um, the out of Africa model where they claim that anatomically modern humans originated out of Africa about 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. Now those are highly theoretical, they're not empirical, mm -hmm. they're not based on how fast human populations actually grow, mm -hmm. uh, how fast humans reproduce and the generation times and so forth. They're based on, on models that are calibrated with evolutionary deep time. And so they're theoretical, they're, all, they're fictional. Mm -hmm. That's what theoretical is, you're, you're taking a best guess based on your presuppositions and in this case, Humans evolved from chimpanzees or a, a shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees in Africa. And then after that, you know, hominids evolved at various you know, levels, which we have no evidence for. And then anatomically modern humans migrated out of Africa 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. But we have some problems with that, even from just a secular perspective or a conventional paleontology perspective because they have found humans um, in China, they dated about 700,000 years ago, and they have found humans mm -hmm. in Southeast Asian islands that they have dated about 2 million years ago. So how, wow. how did they get there if humans did not migrate until 100,000 to 200,000 years ago? Why do you have these, these archaic humans in these other places? And in fact, one guy wrote a book and he actually <laughs> titled his book into Africa, not <laughs> out of Africa, because he claims that humans evolved outside Africa and then moved into Africa. Mm. So be, because of that conflicting data. Interesting. And so what we can do is we, really the, the, the conflict was more with the evolutionarily assumed ages. Exactly. Would you say? So, and I don't call that data as much as uh, interpreted Data. Speculation. <laughs> and so when one guy says, well, it's this many millions and this many, and then they conflict. So they're yeah, so conflicting <laughs> interpretation. Conflicting. Yeah. Uh, and that is common. And that's not just with human ancestor related fossils, hopefuls, but it's also most common with rocks, just straight up like radioisotope dating. Everyone mm -hmm. thinks it's objective, you know, science, but all you're measuring are. Um, isotope ratios to convert those ratios into an age you have to use a formula and that formula always has variables which are letters that you backfill with whatever number you want and it turns out you can backfill those variables with numbers that make sure that the uh, that the resulting age um, fits the this timeline that's in your mind it's really only in textbooks and charts it's not really in the actual fossils or in the actual rocks oh this didn't get the answer i wanted let me try again how and convenient and, and, and that's what they do and now wow. i've i've of course you know expressed that to you know secular friends of mine and <laughs> they're completely unconvinced but i but that was the question that was posed to me do they use circular reasoning when they assign these ages and i was like surely not and at first i was very resistant to this concept mm -hmm. but um i 
I finally actually started examining how did they get this age? Mm -hmm. And then it turns out, well, we assumed it takes a long time for this to happen. We assume it takes a long time for these mutations to have accumulated or these variants, DNA variants. And well, that's an assumption. What led to that assumption? It turns out that, well, we have to, we have to assume that in order to get, we have to assume this really slow mutation rate in order to get um, all the variants that we have in today's population within the vast ages that we know our ancestors have gone through before we got to us. So that's, a, that's called circular reasoning. You're just backfilling it. But when, you know, with evolutionary assumptions, but like Dr. Jeff is saying, when the few studies that come out use like mutation rates and, it's, and they actually measure from one generation to the next, it's usually about 100 new mutations, something like that, every generation. Well, that's way too fast. <laughs> and, but you can get all the variations, the rare variants. There's also common variants, which we think God built into Adam and Eve's genomes, different topic. Um, but the rare variants, you can get all of today's rare variants uh, as a result of um, whatever causes DNA, DNA letters to vary today after, uh, you know, within the time frames, the 6,000 year roughly time frames that, that these studies are showing. So those are some. What about population growth? So, you know, we've had, we've had this recent rapid rise in population. I say recent in terms of the evolutionary time frame of like Dr. Jeff was saying earlier, eons of no population growth, just flat, like replacement value only. Like you have two mm. kids every generation. Every, every, every couple has two kids to replace the parents. And so no population growth for how long? Okay, so that's sort of like a story that's, yeah. let's, that's really convenient for this evolutionary model because we've only seen this population growth happen since recorded history which is what's like the part of history that's in the Bible. I yeah. think it's all of history. How convenient. <laughs> How yes. convenient, yeah. So, uh, so there's that. But then, the, but then if that tale is true, that there's been this long um, eons of pre-humans, ape-like creatures from which we supposedly evolved, where are all the burials? Where are all the burials. We have maybe several thousand ancient human burials. Well, we could fit that into the few hundreds of years that, that the Bible presents as having, you know, been the time frame since the flood while uh, uh, humans have been flourishing uh, since the flood about 4,400 years ago. So the, the, the scant traces of ancient human remains really fits, the, or the low volume of those remains really fits the the recent creation and recent flood model that we have. So those are just so there's genetic data that are ignored by our mainstream colleagues. There's um, um, just considerations that mm -hmm. that um, that we've been able to un uncover that we're that we're seeing fit with what uh, the Bible presents about the history of the world, including Adam. Well, then what about um, since we're talking about the Bible? What then for our brothers and sisters in Christ who may or may not believe in a literal Adam, um, what about biblical evidence? Uh, what about scriptural evidence that speaks to that? Other than, you know, everyone's like, well, you know, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are mytho history or whatever. So let maybe take Genesis out of the picture. What about the Gospels? What about other scripture? Yeah, so I... I wrote a draft of a book, so it's under consideration right now. And maybe someday you guys will see a new book on the importance of Genesis. And it's going to have this graph in it. So I'm looking at this graph, and it's got almost half of the New Testament that's referencing Adam or Noah as real people. Matthew, Luke, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy, Hebrews, 1 and 2 Peter, both. And then Jude. And so this is almost half the New Testament references Adam or Noah as real people. Now, if Adam was not a real person, I'm going to take my eraser and say these biblical authors got it wrong. Erase Matthew, erase Luke, erase Romans. Now, if you erase these books, and then you have to erase the books that refer to those books as being Scripture, guess what you erase in the end? It's all gone. It's all gone. 
So what do we have left? So the Bible, the Bible presents a history, and it and it it's calling our attention, and God is saying, "Are you going to take me at my word, or are you going to trust the words of fallible men who were not there and who are telling stories that that present a history that replaces the history that I have that I have uh, uh, left behind in 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 my word to you." Similarly, I've got this pie chart here uh, talking about Old Testament books that refer to Adam or even Eden, Eden as a play, a real actual place, uh, or Noah. And it's, um, boy, oh boy, it's, it's more than a third of the Old Testament. So Genesis, First and Second Chronicles, uh, Nehemiah, Job, of course, the Psalms, Isaiah, etc. reference um, Adam or Eden, or Noah, as being real history. Hmm. So if we, again, if we erase, we erase Adam from there, you erase a third of the, the Old Testament, and then if you, if you um, uh, look at the, the Old Testament uh, scriptures that refer to other Old Testament books as being scripture, then it all unravels. So God is really saying, good luck figuring this one out on your own, because the Word of God stands together. It all stands together. And once you start saying, oh, I doubt this verse, then you have to doubt the next verse which refers to that verse. And you have to doubt the, reverse, the, the verse that refers to that word verse that referred to the one that you started to doubt. And what we're saying is there is no compelling evidence from outside the Bible that this stuff should be doubted. We've looked at the evidence, and what all it is is a masquerade. It's like this happened so many million years ago or so many hundreds of thousands of years ago. And we go, well, that's not in the Bible, those millions of years. And so uh, human, humans evolving from apes, that's not in the Bible, so I guess the Bible's wrong. Instead of going, maybe the people who wrote this stuff <laughs> about these ages, maybe they're wrong, you know? And that's what Dr. Uh, Tompkins and I have, have been able to have that mind flip from, mm -hmm. from maybe we should question humans, fallible humans, rather than questioning the Word of God. And uh, so, yeah, we invite listeners to join us on that kind of a journey. And for those who are listening in an audio-only format, if you watch this podcast on YouTube, you'll be able to see those charts. We encourage you to do so. Uh, that's just an aside. Yeah. <laughs> do you have any thoughts, Dr. Tompkins, on theological evidence? For yeah, anyone? I mean, you think about it. You know, there are many instances where uh, Adam and Eve and Noah and Eden are all mentioned, but think about this, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God come in the flesh, <laughs> our Creator, said, uh, in the beginning, God created them male and female, and he was responding to a question about divorce, and he was talking about marriage, and he was talking about the very first marriage. And so if Jesus believed there was a literal Adam and a literal Eve, we should too. But then you have to say, well, why is that important? Um, can someone be saved and still believe in evolution and put their faith in Christ? You know, sure. But the fact of the matter is the gospel depends on a real Adam. Adam and Eve fell into sin as the federal heads of the human race. And everyone since then has sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one. And so the gospel depends on a real Adam because Adam and Eve plunged us into sin, plunge this earth and this world into corruption. How do you explain evil? Why do we have, you know, death, disease, corruption, all this sadness, all this, this tragedy? Why do humans um, all over the world act so evil and create all this misery? Well, you have to go back to the beginning mm -hmm. to see what's going on there. But the Lord uh, Jesus Christ came to redeem us by dying for our sins on the cross and through his blood, we, we receive redemption from sin, which all started because of Adam. And, you know, the Apostle Paul uh, spoke of that in the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians. Uh, he was even preaching to a bunch of Greeks and said, you know, God made from one blood all those that dwell upon the face of the earth. So, you know, it's an important central piece of the gospel. Yeah, it's certainly the logical and theological underpinnings. Uh, of mm -hmm. of why why we believe the gospel is legitimate, it's mm -hmm. defensible. It's yeah. not only does the gospel tell us that we are sinners, and we can verify that just by thinking about 
our own guilt. Yeah. I felt bad when I did that. And I feel bad pretty much every day because every time I steal something, I, you know, every time I lie, every time I this, that, the other, I know I'm a sinner. And so I don't need some, I don't need to verify that with the Bible, but it turns out you can. It, it turns out not only is your heart telling you that this is true, that you are a sinner and that you can't save yourself and you need an outside help, um, but the Bible confirms that, um, you know, with with our main problem being the sin problem. And so uh, if we have eons of death and suffering as these pre-human creatures, supposedly, were dying and killing each other for untold uh, amounts of time, then we have death and suffering long before Adam and Eve even came around. And so we have this, we have this rug pulled out from under the gospel where... So when we share the gospel today, we say, hey, the number one problem is a sin problem. And Jesus came to pay our, our sin debt, the death penalty, so that he could commute our death sentence before the great heavenly Father, judge of all earth. And so we say that, and we're like, what, what's sin problem? How, why is that my number one problem? What are you talking about? So we have to be able to say, sin started, started in the garden, and, and then they'll say, well, what about all those fossils of all that death? So if, the, if death is the penalty for sin, that means death follows sin. But in their minds, in our secular friends' minds, death has been around for eons before Adam or any Eve or any garden or any sin. And so we have to do lots of backtracking. Mm-hmm. And But we have a defensible gospel because you don't need to have those fossils representing some sort of uh, era or set of eras that preexisted Adam because we have a Noah's flood, and the flood happens after sin. The flood happens after the garden. And so that puts death after sin, what, where the Bible puts it. And so there's a theological um, uh, aid to taking the Bible at face value mm-hmm. and, that, that, and to placing fossils in the flood or after the Ice Age fossils, that's after the flood also. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that helps us put the, the gospel in perspective. Yes, death really is our real problem. And it has only been around as the temporary intruder into timeline of earth history. And the Lord Jesus will one day remove death. That's why he came and died, is so that he could one day, and that's why he rose again from the dead, is so he could defeat death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Mm-hmm. And so um, he's going to say, that's it, no more death one day. And how do we know? Do we have confidence that he's going to be able to do that? Because he actually he rose from the, yeah. he actually he rose it. from the grave, yeah. and so the 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 underpinnings of the gospel um, get eroded whenever we mm. start to think maybe there was not an Adam. And I'm just like, wait a minute, what what evidence is out there that demands that there be no Adam? Right. And I think you're reading the science wrong because mm-hmm. you're reading, you know, evolutionary um, assumptions. Mm-hmm. and storytelling as though that's scientific, and it's not. So would you say this is a gospel issue, whether Adam is a literal human, a unique human being, or, you know, federal head, as it were? No, it's not a, it's not a gospel issue. It's a gospel underpinning issue, okay. in my view. Okay. Yeah, so you can still, I mean, you can be a believer and believe in a, a mythical Adam. I'm one of them. Yeah. I believed I didn't believe there was a real Adam. Mm. I just knew that I was a sinner and I needed a savior and I trusted Christ, became a Christian. Then God started working on me mm. going, "Now, what else of my word are you going to believe?" And I'm like, "Well, I can't believe the Adam stuff cuz science has proved that wrong." Right. And then he's like, "Are you sure? You know, what science is it that, that so so the Lord used these these relationships in our in our lives and hopefully he uses podcasts in our lives. Yes. <laughs> yes. We hope so too. <laughs> to to get us to a- ask these questions and so <laughs> The result of those of trying to get those answers for my friends was like, you know what, I, I guess there's really not, not a lot of science to support what I thought was scientific. You know, mm. turns out the Bible was more defensible all along. Yeah, I guess the question then would be like, would the thief on the cross alongside Jesus, did he believe in a little literal, literal Adam? Mm. Probably not. Who you knows? know, we 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 can't speak to that. That's but right. <laughs> uh, so. Um, 
I actually have an interesting question and maybe it's a stupid question and y'all can tell me if it is. Um, but what evidences theologically do those in the Christian camp have, or at least claim to have when it comes to a mythical Adam or a non literal Adam? What, what do they say? Like from a scriptural standpoint, how, how do they, how do they stand up on that? Well, I've read their books and they don't. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, right. they cave in to evolution. Yep. They cave in to deep time. Hmm. And scripturally, they fall flat okay. on that whole issue. So they, they, they don't they even al- try. They always appeal to extra biblical exactly. authorities. Okay. Yes. And they say, well, I mean, evolution of humans from apes is an obvious fact. I mean, you've got Australopithecus, and then they name all the Pithecuses or whatever. And, it, and so it's like, well, have you gone in and looked at each one of those? named fossils and like some of our colleagues have done. And it turns out, as Dr. Tompkins said at the beginning of this podcast, each one of those fossils uh, turns out to be either can be interpreted as from the evolutionists themselves. They interpret it as uh, either a human or extinct ape. So it's an either animal or ape. And the ones that are supposedly transitional, they're all disputed. Why is it disputed? I mean, if it was real, objective, discernible science, you could just get the same result every time, like dropping a pen and seeing, well, gravity keeps working, gravity keeps working. That's not, that's not uh, what we see. This is not science. It's like one guy says one thing, another guy says a totally opposite thing about the same fossil mm-hmm. because it's totally a subjective storytelling endeavor. Um, well, one thing I've noticed, uh, basically these Australopithecus creatures, they have different species, but... They're basically all extinct chimpanzee-like creatures. And then next up the ladder are these archaic humans, like Homo erectus, Neanderthal. And, and, but yet they have features that we see in human populations today, like a large brow ridge, a sloping forehead, uh, other, other features that uh, a sagittal crest on the, the top of the head we still see these among living humans. You could go to the shopping mall and sit there for an hour and see people with so-called archaic features. Especially if I go to the shopping mall. <laughs> yeah. You'll so, see one there. So anyways, that's all you really have. And, and I talked about the DNA evidence. So there is absolutely no reason whatsoever to say science supports a non-literal atom. Science supports a literal atom and a biblical timeline. So here's, so if, if the, so what's at stake? Why, why right. are we getting so, and I, I'm turning into your role here. <laughs> Trey. This is going to be it. fun. Yeah, hey, you're but, passionate about this. I can tell. Uh, Go for it. Yeah. So here's, let me throw this different angle into the mix. Why? What would motivate us, even as Christians, to teach pastors to tell their congregations, mm. no, there's no Adam. That's, Evolution's a fact, and you're just going to have to modify the Bible to right. fit those facts. If we say there was a literal Adam who lived in a literal garden, then we got the reason we would say that is because we're going with a straightforward understanding of the text of the Bible. And if we do that, then we have to say the, the earth is only <clears throat> 6,000 years old. Did you just say that? Wow. And so if we say that, then guess who's going to laugh at us? All of our friends. Guess who's going to not let us publish books? Our, our secular-minded publishers. Guess what we stand to lose when we stand with the, the straightforward words of God? We stand to lose um, clout. And it turns out that we as people, and I'm just as guilty as the next person, we like to be liked. We have an inner need to be chosen you know, to be accepted, to be in the in crowd. And we don't want to stand out and we don't want to, um, we don't want to become a pariah pushed off to some corner um, because then we'd be lonely. We wouldn't be cool anymore. And so there's a psychological, there's a human need aspect to this whole debate that we, I think we ought to bring in. Mm-hmm. And let's just admit it. If you stand with the word of God, you're going to be persecuted. And even if that persecution merely means not like the persecutions of our forefathers who gave their lives for the gospel, but it, even if it just means you'll lose your tenure or you'll yeah. lose a job opportunity, right. um, which I have done, by or the way. Or someone will make fun of you on Facebook. 
or some, or some of them. Or even happen. worse. Yeah, right. That's the worst. <laughs> social thing media. Yes. Social uh, media. Worst. <laughs> exactly. So, so I think God is asking us, what are you, are you, you know, Isaiah, uh, what was it, chapter 64, in the 60s anyway. I should have prepped for this, but uh, who am I looking for? I'm looking for, I'm looking around the earth, says God, I'm looking for someone who trembles at my word, not, not, succumbing to the fear of man, but it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. Mm. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so I can admonish our listeners. Are you ready to, are you ready to submit? Say, Lord, I want to submit my thinking to your thinking. I want to let you be the boss of what I believe. And it's a wonderful transformation mm. if, you, if you enjoy that process. Yeah. Taking up his cross and following him, not pursuing the three Fs that you talk about. Fame, funding, and fortune, oh, right? right. Ah. Hey, from, from, from Adam yeah. or Apes. Yeah. <laughs> Buy it now. <laughs> yes, go to icr.org slash store, find Adam or Apes. You can purchase a copy. Yeah. Uh, okay, so really we've seen that like there's no real, there's no nothing really to stand on when it comes to like a mythical Adam. Uh, but why is this concept in the church uh, so under fire other than just like fear. Why, why, like we have theologians who, who just, they're desperately clinging to this. And, and <laughs> I know that like, yes, there's the fame funding and fortune aspect of it, but why, like, I, I mean, even in my church, there are those who like, I know are godly people uh, in every aspect of their life, but I've been told by them, like, it's not a big deal. It doesn't really matter. Like, what is... It's not being so divisive, Trey. It's not Trey. being so divisive. <laughs> like, why, why is that such a... Why is that so under fire right now in the church at this point in time? It's the authority of Scripture. Genesis is the foundation to the rest of the Bible. Is Genesis real history or is it not? And the Bible, the gospel, everything is built on what happened in Genesis, especially at the beginning of the world in the first two chapters of Genesis. Also, the global flood and the Tower of Babel, all of these things explain not only the rest of the Bible or, or make the foundation for that in that progressive revelation of God's word, but they also explain the real world around us. Why do we have all these people groups? Well, you have to go back to the Tower of Babel to see where the languages were confused. And certain people who had certain genetic um, traits could only marry or, or interbreed with those they could communicate with verbally. And so then they spread out across the earth after that and created all these different people groups. Anyways, the, the Genesis not only undergirds the whole of Scripture, but also the reality of the world around us and, and what we see. And so what, uh, I'm not sure if I have a direct answer for you, Trey. I may, I, I'm probably just gonna have to say, I don't know why it's so popular right now, except that we have top tier theologians who everyone already respects because, um, because they've built their careers doing good work in certain areas. They're now publishing books saying uh, there was no Adam. And then so we have conservatives going, wait a minute, I've lived my whole life reading the Bible, and I, it's clear that there was really an Adam. And so, and so now it's, it's, the pot is bubbling because we have people like, like, uh, uh, like us in this circle saying, what are you talking about? How can you say that there's no Adam? You better have some really strong evidence to go against what God has to say. Whereas on the other side, they keep putting out these books and that, you know, they have big names and they... And, and, you know, so there's, there's, there's fame, funding, and fortune, <laughs> and, and fear. If you want to add a fear, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Okay, fear, fear of man, yeah, yeah. So that, so there's that. But I yeah. like what what Doctor Tompkins just said about this overarching, this overarching trend. It's it's a, a creation, fall, redemption. So we're in the fallen part. We're in this fallen world, and we're clinging to the promise of redemption. We're cling clinging to the promise of of the world getting not just repaired, but totally renewed, not just going back to the original good garden, and it was very good according to God's pronouncement over it, but going to an even better place, 
better than the original garden, a place where there is no longer any potential for rebellion and sin. Ha, huh, that's going to be fantastic. A place where everyone there has been redeemed and is able to say, not based on anything good that I've done, but based on everything good that you've done and accounted to my account, placed on my account, that's why I'm able to to have this relationship with you, God, and, to, and forever. Now, if we say Adam wasn't real, Genesis wasn't real, we, we erase the whole setup for the whole storyline of all history. So that's another, that's another reason why we think it's good to go back to Genesis and to believe what God said, because there really was a garden and it really, there really was a fall. Creation, good, fall, now it's bad, mm-hmm. and we're waiting for that redemption. Well, if, there, if, if it's always been bad, what are we waiting for? Yeah. Uh, and so, so the redemption, just, just as much as the Bible is true about this creation being good and having fallen because of sin, we are also confident in the promises, yeah. what Peter called these great and precious promises of redemption. New heavens, new earth, resurrected heavens, resurrected earth, and resurrected people to go on it, to live with our God forever. Mm-hmm. Like you said... And this goes all the way back to the beginning, Genesis 3.15, there was a promise made to a literal human being. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any hope. And so what you're talking about is this worldview we have, there's hope for what happens after we die. But what about an evolutionary worldview? What is there any hope there? Or is it just a struggle for survival and we die and we're dust? That's it. Yeah, um, people that have an evolutionary worldview tend to have a low view of the sovereignty of God. And uh, yeah, their their ideas towards mm-hmm. the the end of things is very convoluted, mm-hmm. uh, often depressing. Some of them claim this cosmic battle with evil will go on for millions of years, um, in a in a type of theology called I open theism. Not. So, <laughs> um, anyways, who are generally by and large complete evolutionists who, who espouse that, but. You know, all is not lost. There are some very famous theologians like uh, John Frame, uh, Cornelius Van Dam, who you will have on the podcast soon, uh, and others, and some have passed away recently, some are still alive, that do hold to a literal genesis. So, so all is not entirely lost uh, amongst the, the academic community um, as far as theology goes, but there are some very vocal voices who are... Um, raising doubts about Genesis and, and the literal Adam. And they'll have to answer for that. Mm-hmm. I was thinking that the, such a low view of God and a low view of his word, but he's the one who's supposed to get the glory and he's far beyond us. Well, any final thoughts today, guys? No, I would just um, assure all those Christians out there who are wavering on this that the science... And, and the scripture and the historical accuracy of Genesis completely uh, match up and line up. And you don't have to believe in theoretical, fictional evolution and try and put that narrative onto the Bible and literally wreck the Bible. It's unnecessary. Yeah. Amen. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I, just, I totally agree with that. And I would say it's time for us Christians to, frankly, stop being lazy and stop being, uh, in, in, in other words, it's just too easy for us to say, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. Because when we say that, like your friend at your church, Trey, it's like we're exempting ourselves from the work of investigating the issue to find out the truth of what's going on, either in the Word of God or in the scientific literature. So I would say dig in. Dig in. And, and so because we don't want Christians who are walking around going, yeah, I'm a Christian and you should be too. Well, why should I be a Christian? Well, because, you know, you're a sinner and, and we need a Savior. That's what Christianity is about. What do you mean by sin? Oh, well, sin started in the garden and with the Adam who didn't really exist. And This is unraveling uh, really fast. This is <laughs> yeah. unraveling. So I'm out of here. Yeah. It, falls, it falls apart pretty quickly. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. we don't want Christians who, are, who are, um, uh, have such a weak witness that we just cower in the corner of our closet. Uh, we want Christians who, are, who have investigated the issue for themselves, who have dug into the Scripture, 
who have dug into even some of the science. If if you and and it is discernible. It's not it's not a black box. You know you can you can figure out where the assumptions squeeze in and masquerade as science. It takes a little bit of work, uh, and you can get there. Um, and so digging in so that we have Christians who will say, "Yeah, you should become a Christian." Well, why? Well, because you're a sinner and you need a savior. Well, what is sin? Well, sin is started in the garden with a with we all came from one blood, Acts 14. And that was in that was with Adam and Eve who sinned the first sin. And that's why Christ, who is the last Adam, who took the place of the first Adam, and what the first Adam failed to do, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, succeeded in doing and offers and extends to anyone who will to come and trust him and have everlasting life. Now that's a more confident sounding gospel. So we have to get ready to, def- to defend what, know what we believe and why we believe it and dig in. That'll preach. Hey. Uh, Amen. <laughs> well, awesome. Um, thank you all so much for uh, being here, for sharing your thoughts and your expertise. We really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we couldn't do it here without y'all. So thank y'all for, for joining us on this podcast. And for all of our listeners and viewers, thank you for being here as well. As a reminder, like, subscribe, share with your friends and family. And if you have questions or if you just have, hey, if you have comments, if you have something that you want to say to us, uh, let us know in the comments below. We'll be glad to uh, try to get those to to the relevant people, try to answer some of your questions. So thank you all so much. We'll see you next time on creation.live.